say I'd like to welcome you all to our October 17th uh, meeting, our Zoom meeting uh, here. And this is, shows a photograph of our Audubon house, Brittany. Uh, it's supposed to look like a couple of uh, birdhouses. Uh, oh, I didn't notice that. <laughs> um, we our Audubon Advocate Program is going on. Lou Mullen uh, is the, a, a great artist in our community, and she teaches the kids how to draw. So they they all end up drawing a bird. Uh, <laughs> this one, the, most of the pe kids try to draw one like it looks, but this girl on the right uh, kind of has their own idea what a what a nice bird looks like. But uh, you can see that a cool. So, yeah. Uh, we're starting a, a new, we have our Audubon Advocate Program, which, uh, which is, you know, four uh, Title I county schools come to our Audubon, one school on Monday, one on Tuesday, one on Wednesday, one on Thursday for four weeks. But we're starting a new program called the River Kids, which is going to be meeting on Saturdays for kids of all ages to come from, this is going to be from 10 to 12. They'll be coming down to our Audubon house, but they will be going out uh, doing other activities uh, in the community. And uh, we want them to think about being a little bit political in the sense that they would want to uh, try to get people to preserve our environment and be conscious of, of things that we need to do with their parents, their sibs, and uh, their friends. So this is a new program that we're starting in our county, and we're doing this with the Clean Water Coalition uh, is helping us uh, fund this thing for us. Uh, I mentioned before, but when we were just talking before the meeting, but we let, hope that you're all going to vote for the new bond issue. It's for uh, $50 million. Uh, it only would cost sort of the average person, though, uh, $3.60 a month. Uh, so it is there to protect our water sources, our natural areas, wildlife habitats, and to maintain our quality of life. It is there to uh, purchase uh, uh, lands uh, that need to be uh, conserved, both wetlands and uh, also forests. It's to restore our Indian River Lagoon, acquire land to protect our drinking water. Acquire land to protect uh, water quality of our lakes and creeks and lagoon and protect our wildlife and preserve the natural habitat. So we hope that you, it's one, uh, on, on the, I vote in the county and it's the last thing on the ballot. So you might even get <laughs> checking off all those things, but the last thing on the ballot is our, our bond issue. Uh, our other program is our Trees for Life, Plants for Birds. We have distributed over 14,400 uh, native trees and plants of over uh, 40 species. Um, I see uh, Steve Palmquist is on tonight and uh, he's been helping us with this project. We recently have received uh, some nice Southern live oak in, uh, in three gallon pots that are about seven feet tall pond cypress in six feet tall and three gallons. And we have a bunch of Dahu and Hollies that are a couple of feet tall. Uh, the, you can come down at, to the Audubon house to pick these up. These are all free. We have other uh, about 40 species that we are selling at a minimum amount, like $6 a pot uh, for one gallon and a little bit more for larger sizes. Uh, we are open for this on Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays from 9 to 11 a.m. So come down and get yourself a free tree. We'd just love to have you do that. Um, we planted, uh, this is kind of old news, back in January, we planted a demonstration education garden, native garden at the county commission at the entrance. And it is doing really well, growing very nicely. Um, and uh, producing lots of uh, nice flowers and gets a lot of uh, attention of people traveling there to it. Uh, it is also, we have a post there at the garden where they can pick up pamphlets like uh, what plants are good for bees, butterflies, and birds. And we tell some of the bad things about turf grass and the good things about trees, what they can do for our environment. This got us started, and we've got a new partner now called Up Against Poverty. Uh, this is a, not too far from the county commission, and he, he 
contacted the uh, executive director, Matt uh, contacted me and said, would you, would you do a demonstration garden for us too? And so uh, I said, yes. And they do some wonderful work for people that are below the po poverty level. They were helping them get jobs, uh, do resumes for them, help them in training and membership, uh, mentorship. And they have a big grocery there about the size of uh, Publix that where they give out a lot of uh, uh, inexpensive uh, food. Uh, they get, have more than 10,000 visitors and it's a large building with, uh, with uh, classrooms. So it's a place for us to educate people on, on plants too. So we're excited about working with them. Our field trips what, and nature can, morning. Can we interrupt just for a second? Yeah. Can you tell us sure. more about that? Where are they located? Uh, they're located just a block or so away from the county uh, complex, uh, the, where the county commission is, the health uh -huh. department, where you uh -huh. pay your taxes. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh, they're just uh, east of that. It's a large building. It's a huge building, probably the largest building in the area. Okay. Uh, and uh, so you can you can just about walk there from the county commission where you park. But they do have their own parking lot. Uh, I don't remember the exact street name that they have at the entrance, but uh, you you can find it online, I'm sure. Uh, these are field trips that we have for the next month or so. Uh, uh, they are listed uh, on our website. Uh, Bob does a terrific job in uh, putting them up there. Uh, we, some of them are, are quite, only allow 10 or 15 or 20 people to attend. They are uh, led by expert uh, birders. Uh, you need to sign up to go on these trips. Uh, uh, so you get on our website, uh, find out what trips you want to go to and then sign up for it. You can also see that other people who have signed up for it and sometimes you'll see your friends or great birders that you would like to be with to learn about birds. So it's a, it's a great opportunity. Uh, this is our telegram uh, for October. What we're doing in, in our telegram is that we, uh, we put, we have a bird photo contest and we want all photographers to send us uh, pictures of birds. So we every month we have a different bird on the cover of it. This is the Bobo Link, uh, and it was done by Henry Young. But every month we have a different bird that gets selected from those that submit them. So we encourage photographers to submit, send their, their pictures to us. Our next Zoom meeting is kind of an interesting one that I have never had a heard about. I, mean, I go on the Christmas bird count, but it's gonna talk, we're gonna have Dee Simpson and Kate Wells who organized the, the Christmas bird count for uh, the South, for our area. Uh, it's gonna talk about the history, uh, local history about it and how to get involved. Next bird count. And, and the next South uh, Bavard Circle will hold this year's on Friday. Uh, December 30th, uh, this year. So if you're interested in participating, and especially after you probably see their presentation, it's a wonderful time. You get to go with different, very well uh, experienced birders. And uh, it's it's fun. You spend the, the, the uh, 24 hours, but most of it is during the daylight time, as much time as you have going around to a specific area and counting the birds there. The Christmas bird count is probably the best data in the whole wide world uh, that shows that we're having global warming and that we're losing our birds. Uh, this is a fantastic uh, uh, data. Uh, the Christmas bird count is done all over the world since Nita's just telling me 1903. So it's got lots and lots of data. And you can look look up on eBird and see the data, and you can look up on eBird and see uh, what birds are found in a particular area. You can put say, I like to know how many birds are there found in around my house, and you can look it up, and there'll be somebody there that will tell you, or there'll be information there telling you how many birds are there. 
have been found there in the past. So we, we're looking for volunteers. Uh, we could help get help in some of the housekeeping, the, the bathrooms, the classroom, and the breezeway. Um, we could use also help in the nursery and our educational gardens. Uh, it's, we, there is a little bit of weeding that needs to be done and make uh, an hour or so a week uh, would be nice. And then you'd learn about plants too if you wanna come and do that part of it. And some of you uh, help with the newsletter, uh, folding and stuffing the envelopes. We appreciate that on a monthly basis. We get many of you actually are leading morning nature walks and uh, doing field trips for us. And if you have a favorite spot and you like to take people there, you don't have to even know much about the birds, but if you just like walking around there, in your, in your neighborhood, we'd love to have you uh, set up a like an hour, hour and a half walk. This, then we have some, we have the air pot uh, potato vine around us. And if you want to come and help pull air potatoes and collect them, we would uh, appreciate that. Uh, we have some great videos. I show this every month, but this is really some fantastic. Uh, most all our, um, talks that we've given here on Zoom are uh, on our video so that you can get online and see the talks that you missed. Um, in addition to that, Catherine Nix and Bob Montanero have done some nice sh videos on different birds and different animals in different areas uh, of our, uh, found in our county here. So we, we have a lot of good information on our website. Right now in the fall, we are in the middle of migration. And this is one uh, video I'm pointing out that gives the hot spots for viewing migratory birds in Indian River, Bavard, and St. Lucie counties. So this, this tells you where to go, this video, to see the various uh, birds migrating through our area. And that brings us to our talk tonight. We have so lucky to have Brittany Pirsama a field biologist for Audubon Western Everglades, and she's giving a talk on owls of the southeast, southwest Florida, excuse me. She uh, has a BS in environmental science and has worked as a zookeeper at, in Naples Zoo for four years. She has a wide range of experience in southwest Florida wildlife and for volunteering with FWC. Florida Wildlife Conservation, and the Rookery Bay Panther Refuge and Audubon. And I've been talking with her just before the, the, we started this meeting, and uh, she's a fantastic person, has done so much. So I'm going to get off of this, and then we'll let uh, Brittany uh, take over here. Hello, but everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining tonight. I'm really excited to talk about the burrowing owls. Uh, there's a lot of interesting information about them, but I also will be talking a little bit about their journeys during the recent hurricane that hit our area. So I have a lot of fun photos and videos for you to enjoy uh, throughout this entire presentation. So to start off, I'll give a little bit of background on myself. Um, I'm originally from Illinois. Uh, I always knew I wanted to work with wildlife or animals, anything in that realm. So one of the first jobs that I did was working as a vet tech. Um, I, I grew up with a lot of pets, so it was very familiar with me to take care of a lot of different animals. Um, I quickly realized that I wanted to be outside working in the field. Um, so I slowly spent time volunteering with different organizations, and I realized that I wanted to work at a zoo. Um, I started interning at the Naples Zoo initially, and at that point, with all the hours I gained from volunteering and interning, um, I officially got a job there, and then I worked towards my degree at the same time. So I was working a full-time job at the zoo while actually doing online school um, towards an environmental science degree. I wanted something that was just broad, something that I could use in any direction. I didn't know if I wanted to stay in the zoo world forever. So being able to work in that position allowed me to also start gaining experience volunteering in different areas on the side. So as he mentioned, I volunteered with Panther Refuge, Big Cypress, Rookery Bay. There's a frog watch group that's in our county that actually goes around and listens for all the frogs at night so we can understand they are an indicator species so we can see how our environment is doing. 
And then of course I started getting involved with FWC and Audubon. So gaining all that experience, I was able to build up my resume and I applied for my first job as a seasonal shorebird biologist under Florida Fish and Wildlife. Uh, so in that position, I was in charge of the area of beach called Sand Dollar. It's on Marco Island. Uh, and we had a bunch of different birds that are nesting on this beach. A lot of education to the public, protecting the birds with their eggs on the beach, uh, and a lot of management going on in that location. Seasonal jobs are hard because, of course, they end, and then you have to look for more work. I was lucky enough uh, to get contacted by Audubon Western Everglades that they had a seasonal position in the wintertime. So I swapped back and forth between Florida Fish and Wildlife and Audubon Western Everglades for a bit until Audubon Western Everglades offered me a position. Um, so now I work for them as a full-time biologist and I help with their three main conservation programs. Um, I did also work as an eco tour guide on the side uh, and that was really beneficial for knowing more about the environment that I was working in and interacting with the public as well. So if you're not familiar with Audubon Western Everglades, we are a nonprofit organization. Our main goal is, of course, helping out with protecting Southwest Florida's natural resources. Uh, so we do this through advocacy, education, and community science. The three main conservation programs that we have are our winter shorebird program. So this deals with a lot of the migration coming to the area. We do stewardship out in the beach. So we have a steward, we have volunteers that go out and educate the public to respect the flocks of birds that have traveled thousands of miles to our areas, walk around them. Uh, we wear shirts and we have signs that say, ask me about the birds. And that kind of sparks the curiosity of people who are walking down the beach and they're not sure why there are this many birds in the area. It's, it's interesting to see how many people aren't aware that a lot of the birds that are on our beaches aren't even from um, our state. The next program we have is our most well-known program is burrowing owls. Uh, the burrowing owl program has quite a history and that involves a lot of work of protecting these species that are living in our area. And then our third program is a bit newer. Um, it's about two years now that we have started a gopher tortoise program and we are surveying all habitat on Marco Island. And we're trying to understand the population of tortoises there, what struggles they're facing and uh, working with the city uh, and giving some education that we are discovering during our surveys to FWC as well um, when they're making their decisions on any kind of protections for that. So we couldn't do any of this work without our amazing group of volunteers. Uh, we have over 60 volunteers that assist with surveying, outreach, and any monitoring in our area. So to start off with a history of our burrowing owl program, and it actually has quite a long history. So Marco Island, it was not a native area that burrowing owls actually were. Um, although it is now the second largest population of burrowing owls in the state of Florida, uh, they originally weren't there. Uh, so when development started and we started seeing all these sand piles coming along as they're developing the whole area of Marco, we think that's what interested these owls in moving to the area. If you're familiar with burrowing owls, even with construction sites, anything that has that sandy, suitable soil for them to dig when they're flying around, if they spot that, they're going to be attracted to it. Obviously, at the same time, these owls are losing habitat inland. Um, so you think of areas such as Disney World. Uh, you know, that's taking a lot of habitat away from these owls, uh, as well as tortoises, too. So they're looking for different areas to be able to have a place to burrow and have their young. Um, so uh, it was estimated that it was about 1972, I believe, that the first owls came to Marco Island. It was a very small population to start. Uh, and slowly over time, they started increasing. But there really wasn't much protections at that time um, until Nancy Ritchie, who was the environmentalist on Marco Island, she was working for the city from about 2000 to 2015. She started going around and putting up protective barriers around all of the owl burrows. She was educating the public. And then she gained a bunch of volunteers to help with weed whacking these sites to make sure they had suitable digging. And of course, just making sure that any new burrows that pop up, they are protecting those as well. So she had a group of small group of volunteers that went around and helped her out. Um, so now when she left the city, she still works with us to this day and she has her own business, but she's still very much involved in this program. But two main volunteers took over the program from there and were helping out with weed whacking and protecting the owls. And their names were Jean and Carol. Uh, and when they were starting to do all of this, the owls were significantly increasing in numbers. 
to the point that they couldn't do it on their own. They reached out to Audubon Western Everglades and said, hey, we have a huge issue going on. We wanna protect these owls. We can't do it by ourselves. Uh, and Audubon Western Everglades then took over that old owl prowl program and turned it into the owl watch of Audubon Western Everglades. Um, so as of right now, we have 60 to 70 volunteers and we monitor these owls year round. During the nesting season, obviously it's a great time to track how many chicks they're having, where the burrows are popping up, uh, and watching any struggles that they're facing during the off season is a really important time that our volunteers are monitoring for development, making sure that people have legal permits, making sure that they're not running over these burrows. If any new ones pop up, we're getting permission to post them as soon as we can. And all of this is just very important in making sure we can secure this population and make sure they're safe. Um, prior to me, there was a biologist named Ellie Smith, and she was working towards her master's by also getting involved with banding owls. Uh, so we put little ankle bracelets, just like you've seen on a lot of these migratory birds, and that really helped understand how long they're living, uh, where they're moving, and going forward, that is what I am continuing. So in the last year, I have been training under the same professor, uh, and he's been helping us going forward, trying to make sure we can band as many as possible. So the basics of burrowing owls, they are a ground dwelling bird species. Now there's actually 22 subspecies of burrowing owls in the world, but we only have two in North America. So we are familiar with the Florida burrowing owl, um, but the Western burrowing owl are equally as important and equally facing different struggles. Um, there are a bit differences between the two, which I'll mention in a minute, um, but there's a lot of similarities as well. Now they are basically identical when you're looking at the males and females. You can't tell them apart unless you are during nesting season and you're watching behaviors. So typically when the female is inside that burrow incubating the eggs, the male will be at the front guarding the burrow, protecting the burrow. That's really the only time that we can assume the gender, um, but unless they are banded, we can never say 100%. You know, there could be a time that you come to a burrow and they've swapped places for a second because they're coming out to feed. They are very small. They're only about the size of a Coke can, if you're looking at the height of them. Very incredibly small owl, but they are excellent at digging. Uh, they have tiny talons, and we've watched them dig through a variety of different habitats, from rocky habitats, of course, soft sand soils, sometimes mulch, anything that they can find a good area to be able to dig their burrows. Uh, but the oldest burrowing owl that has been noted, it was about nine years and 11 months old, and that owl was obviously banded. They were able to track that individual. In our area of Marco Island and in Collier County in general, we have so far seen that they don't exceed the age of five to six years old. We think this is increasingly because of development, so we're getting affected by car strikes uh, by living in areas where sometimes people have outdoor cats. So there's a lot of threats, although there's benefits to living in an urban area, it's a lot of threats that they're facing that may significantly reduce um, their ability to live longer. So the most important thing, of course, to realize is that these burying owls are protected in our state, they are a threatened species. Um, so in our state, we are having protections from Florida Fish and Wildlife, this ensures that any time that someone wants to develop on a property, they have to get a permit and do a proper removal of that burrow. Um, compared to if you're thinking of tortoises that have to be relocated, burrowing owls do not have to be relocated. Their burrow has to be scoped so you can check and make sure that there's no eggs or any nesting material inside of it. Uh, as long as all the chicks are fledged, they basically excavate that burrow, fill it in, and then the burrow, uh, burrowing owls are, have to find their own home again. Um, so a lot of times when we have sites that are removed, we're keeping track of those sites because if people don't quickly start with development, um, very quickly the owls will come back and redig on that property because they see that property as theirs. Uh, so that's other things that we're always keeping an eye out for. They also are protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Now our owls in Florida do not migrate. They actually stay in our area throughout the entire year. Uh, we only had one owl that was discovered on the other coast that flew from Marco to Miami. Sadly, it uh, flew into a window at the airport, so it did not survive, but it was something that we are able to then look at the bands of that owl since they had banded it um, to see that it is an individual from Marco Island. So that's why banding is so important. Now, looking at these eye colors, uh, if you're most familiar with the ones on the left, 
this is the main color that you would see in burning owls. So that yellow eye is what you're used to. Now we have a lot of different variations of eyes on Marco Island, uh, and it's becoming increasingly more common in different areas of Florida as well. And I have spoken with Western burrowing owls, their biologists have said they have not seen it in their area, but I've talked with a biologist in South America and that subspecies, they have seen this eye difference. So it's not just Marco Island, it's not just Florida. It's something that we think is just genetic differently all over, it's not affecting them at all. Um, last season, I actually decided to have our volunteers monitor the sites and note which ones had different eye colorations and 49 of the sites had owls with different eye colors. So it's a, it's a pretty big number. Um, 49 is out of about 340 sites. It's a decent size of the population that has this cool differences. So we'll see brown, we'll see what looks like black. Sometimes we see green. Um, it looks like a tortoise shell. So all different varieties. It's, it's kind of creepy sometimes when they come out of the burrow and it's just a jet black versus the yellow that you're used to. So their burrows are about six to 10 feet long. Um, and it really all depends on the environment. It also depends on how they're living. Some of the owls that I've seen, they like having multiple burrows. So typically when the female is nesting and all those chicks are starting to come out, the male digs what we call his man cave. So the male will go over, dig a separate burrow. He hangs out there while the female is doing most of the taking care of the young. He'll still bring food in, but he wants his space. Um, sometimes if they're bored, they may dig more burrows and they may have four to 10 burrows at one single property that this whole family is able to live in. They use them as protection. It really all depends. Then we have other owls that only have one burrow and they only have one burrow every single year. So that burrow becomes pretty extensive because they're constantly maintaining it. Um, so some of those burrows can be 10 to 15 feet long because they're spending so much time. And with all those chicks, you got to have room. Now in Florida, they dig their own burrows. The Western burrowing owls only use abandoned burrows, such as armadillos, skunks, tortoises. In Florida, it's very interesting that they dig their own. But once again, when I spoke with the biologists in South America, they also dig their own. So they are capable if they find something that is suitable. We have had a couple situations where they have taken over tortoise burrows, kicked out the gopher tortoise for their nesting season, and then they leave once they're done with the nesting season. So it really all depends. Now they do lay about two to 12 eggs. On Marco Island, I'd say the average chick survival is usually about three to four chicks, but we have had a pair that had eight chicks. That's a lot of mouth to feed, a lot of kids to take care of and ensure that they are protected. So it really all depends. Um, incubation for the eggs is about a month, 28 days, and then it takes six weeks for these chicks to fledge. So that's a lot of time that they're practicing flying, they're moving around, learning how to feed, but that's the biggest time that they have to stay protected and make sure that they know how to run into their burrow anytime there's danger around. Now, I don't know if you have ever seen a burrow and owl burrow before, but decoration is one of the most unique things. And um, this is something that we see in a variety of different areas and they're all different. So during the nesting season, if a male does not have a mate yet, he will dig a burrow, he will stand at the front of that burrow and he will call all night long, trying to attract a mate to his burrow. But another thing that he will spend time on is decoration. Uh, now we get a variety of different decoration. We get trash, uh, we get natural items such as flowers or trees or wood items. Um, and then we also get a variety of items that can become entanglements as well. So we have to keep an eye out and make sure that they're not bringing in things such as masks that was really a go-to during the year of COVID. We had a lot of owls that were bringing in these masks and we had to quickly remove them before they did become an entanglement. Um, but we think that they decorate their burrow for a couple of different reasons. We can't really 100% say, but number one, the male is kind of showing off. Uh, it's his way of attracting a mate to the burrow, showing what he can bring, whether it's prey items, whether it's shiny objects. Another thing that you might notice in some of these photos is you might see feces. They bring feces from dogs, they bring feces from tortoises, anything they can find. And one reason we think they do that in anything that's stinky in general may conceal anything that's below in their burrow. So any predators may not be quickly figuring out that there's eggs and chicks in their burrow if they're smelling something strong up above. And the third reason is that we think they do this is to attract food sources. If you're gonna put out some feces in front of your burrow, that's gonna attract bugs, that's gonna attract lizards. 
and it brings all the food items that they would like right to the entrance of their borough. It gives their chicks a great place to be able to just practice within safety. Um, so it's pretty crazy when you go around during nesting season. Some of the burrows are in people's front yards. So we have owners that are willing, allowing these owls to decorate with a lot of different objects in their front yards, but it's one of our favorite time of the year to go around and see all the differences. Now, burrowing owls are birds of prey. And I think because they're so small, sometimes people forget that. Um, one of my favorite stories that I have of watching burrowing owls hunting was a burrowing owl that captured a cardinal. You think of how fast cardinals are, the fact that these owls are able to quickly shoot over and grab them so quickly. Um, it happened so fast that I, I couldn't believe it. Um, but it's important to realize that they are eating a lot of different things aside from insects, lizards, frogs. And they're also looking for small mammals. Uh, and of course, like I mentioned, small birds. So we see a variety of different items. Sometimes they use them as a display, as a decoration, but at the same time, they have a lot of mouths to feed. They're gonna do a lot of hunting. Uh, most of the hunting does happen towards nighttime, and that's when we risk the car strikes a lot. But we do see hunting that will happen throughout the day as well, especially if their chicks start getting hungry anyway. So uh, we just finished up our nesting season and we are actually gonna have our celebration coming up soon for all of our volunteers, but we had a pretty incredible nesting season, especially with all of the challenges that these owls were facing on Marco Island. Development would be number one. So we had 76 volunteers that were monitoring 366 sites. So sites mean that there's a burrow there. Doesn't mean that there may be an owl there, but we know that it's habitat. The burrow is accessible, open, and at any time owls may switch around. If they lose a mate, they move to, may move to a different area. So it all depends. On Marco Island, uh, we had 259 active sites, meaning there was at least one owl at some time on that site. 238 pairs of owls. They had 190 nests and they fledged 542 chicks. Um, if you're not familiar with our general numbers, this is very good, uh, especially for a season that they were facing a lot of habitat loss. Uh, we also had lucked out with a lot of the storms. We only had one tropical storm that came through our area during the nesting season. So most of these owls had a very dry season. They were able to not only produce chicks, but some of them had multiple broods, uh, meaning that they nested a second time and had more chicks. We also have an area of Isles of Capri uh, that's really close by to Marco Island. We have nine active sites there with seven pairs of owls, six nests, and 14 fledged chicks. We have a separate little neighborhood that's called Fiddler's Creek in Naples. They had three active sites with five pairs of owls, three nests, and 11 fledged chicks. And the city of Naples. Uh, we actually have one pair that is living in the area of the playground of a middle school in the city of Naples. And they've nested there for several years, right by the track and field area. And then we also have another pair that is in the middle of the city of Naples in a neighborhood that's under construction. So they found a, a pretty good area for them to be able to dig. So only two sites in Naples, but we have two pairs there. Uh, and only one of those pairs fledged young this year, but they successfully fledged four chicks. Now our starter burrow program, if you see this guy on the left that's in the photo, this is his front yard. And we have a great program that is between us, Florida Fish and Wildlife, and the city of Marco Island. Essentially what it is, is we dig the start of a burrow. So we dig down with a pretty shovel that makes it curve and looks like a burrow. And we dig it out, we make fresh sand, we add a perch, and we try to make it look really attracting to owls in people's front yards. With the lack of habitat, this is really the best bet for these owls. When this started, we weren't really sure if it was gonna work or not. We weren't sure if they were gonna adapt to living in people's front yards. But this year, and we ramped up making sure that all of this habitat is really maintained. The burrows are kept fresh and, and inviting to the owls. We have seen that it is, is successful. So we had 92 starter burrows on Marco Island. A lot of the population wants owls in their yard, which is incredible. You know, it's great to know that we have that support. We had six starter burrows in Fiddler's Creek, two in Isles of Capri. 37 of these burrows became excavated by owls, meaning that they felt comfortable enough to go in a front yard and dig out that burrow. 17 of them remain occupied for the whole nesting season. 
and 11 of them were pairs of owls that had nests and they fledged 28 chicks. So it's pretty great that they are able to adapt to living in this. Uh, this is one thing about the owls that is very different compared to any other species I've worked with. Being willing to nest in someone's front yard, especially with cars, children, dogs, people walking the sidewalks, it's, it's crazy that they're willing to do that. So this year, uh, as I mentioned, we started banding. Uh, we restarted this program, and this has really been beneficial in ensuring that we can track these populations. So up in the center, you'll see Raul, and he has been the main person that has been training me with this process. And we banded a significant amount of owls over the last season, and this was really beneficial for us to track how long they're living, where they're going, especially with all the development, and tracking these pairs to see how successful they are year after year, especially with their young. Now the young owls, uh, we know that there's a large majority of them that they won't survive to adulthood. So we actually only put one band on them colored with the metal. So our chicks are banded orange over metal and that way if they are able to survive till adulthood, then we can add more bands to them. Um, but each adult owl that we banded gets its one USGS band with three colors. Uh, of course, each one has to be individual and different, that way we can keep them all separate. We also have a great club um, that we do with children on Marco Island. Uh, one of our volunteers, her name is Stephanie Parker. She reached out to us and she said that at their school at Tommy Barfield, they have clubs once a month and each kid gets to choose what club they wanna be in. So she started the Burying Owl Club. Uh, what's great about this is that they actually have burying owls at their school, right in their playground. They've nested there for several years. Um, so a lot of the kids get to watch them every day. So it's been really fun. The last year, we spent a lot of time going through and teaching them about the owls. We went out and monitored them. We went out and made sure that we could learn more about the habitats that they're living in. They got to decorate perches. We did owl pellet dissection. I had a lot of different crafts, and that was really helpful in making sure we could educate the public as well. So these kids spent the last week uh, that we spent with them, they were decorating signs that we put all over the island. Um, that way we can encourage the public to understand more about this species. So one of the coolest things about burying owls on Marco Island is that they are coexisting with gopher tortoises. Now this is probably my favorite property on Marco Island. It has 144 gopher tortoise burrows on it. Uh, it's really not that large of a property. Uh, it's probably a double size of a property, but uh, they're using every inch of that land, and it is an area that we definitely have historic looser remains and things that are really vital for this habitat. So there's upland, um, there's area that they have that has excellent forage, there's cactus, so variety of different things going on there. But at the front of that property, um, for several years, we have had a burrowing owl pair that has nested in one of the burrows. Um, we don't know if they came in and dug that burrow or if they took it over from a gopher tortoise and made it their own. But when their chicks fledge, and for the last couple of years, they have had five to six chicks, they have 144 burrows that they can use as protection. So they do very well. Um, these tortoises are, you know, they commensal species that are able to use all their burrows. This is a great example. So these owls are able to use any burrow that they could find for that safety. So how are they adapting to living on Marco Island? Uh, I've talked about it a bit, but these are some great photos to look at to truly see how they're adapting to an, an urban environment. So number one, construction does not keep them away. They dig, re-dig on construction sites. They dig next to construction sites. Uh, we have to ensure that protective barriers are gonna be put up to make sure there's no driving of vehicles in any areas. That's the biggest threat to them, but they do not mind the noise. They actually enjoy watching it. Any homes that are being built, they use as refuge. So a lot of times the workers will tell me that they have owls hanging out in their home while they're doing construction. They also use areas that are gonna be urban areas such as sidewalks, swales, anything that's gonna give that burrow some structure. So you'll see them dig into a sidewalk. That's gonna be a lot better because that burrow isn't gonna easily collapse. It has that roof overhead to keep it safe. The photo in the top center is at a golf course. Uh, it may not be something that every golf course would wanna have in their area, but we are lucky enough to have people that are very excited. Uh, this is actually in their driving range, which we were very worried about at first, 
but the owls have adapted and they have not been hit by a golf ball that we've seen so far. They're pretty smart. And now there is a second pair that has moved into this golf course. So two pairs that the owners are and all of the workers there are protecting very well. Um, and then you'll see different things such as them digging underneath signs, anywhere that they can find fresh sand. So we always say that if you're going to loosen up the soil anywhere when you're putting in a sign or anything, we're just waiting for an owl to move in because it's going to attract them to that area. At the same time, obviously, they're facing a lot of threats in urban areas. Um, so number one I've mentioned before is car strikes. That's the biggest issue that we have. Um, number two would be looking at things that are more uh, rodenticide, uh, things that are toxins, poisons that may be affecting them. And then number three, I'd say is violations. So people that are filling in burrows, running over burrows because they don't want to pay for removal. That's the biggest reason that we have all these volunteers that are monitoring these sites. Anything that they see, we immediately get called and we go over and ensure that we can dig out those burrows as quickly as possible. Um, thankfully, all the eyes on the ground, we can watch out for cars that are parked too close. We have a new borough that we're not aware of. A lot of the citizens on Marco Island are reaching out to us, sending us photos. That photo that you see uh, in the bottom, the two bottom ones in the center, uh, that has to deal with entanglement. So I talked about the mass. Uh, that's number one. We had one owl that it took us six hours to capture because it had a mask wrapped around its neck, their legs. They can have any kind of string, rope get entangled as well, especially in their talons. And then outdoor cats. That's, of course, something that we're really trying to educate the public. You can take your cat outside on a leash, keep it in a lanai, but cats outdoors are never a good thing for any bird species in our areas. In top right photo, of course, we have general diseases or any issues that are going on that we're going to keep an eye out for, but thankfully, we haven't had much that's been affecting these owls. This owl seemed to have some sort of eye infection, and we brought it to the vet in our area and the local rehab was able to actually remove that eye because it was going to do detrimental to that owl. Um, they're able to live with one eye, totally fine. We watched her for a while after release and checked on her for several days and she was completely fine moving around, feeding on her own. Um, and at that time, her chicks were already raised. Uh, we, we watched them grow up and we waited till her chicks were grown up before we took her into rehab. As I mentioned, uh, this is one of the biggest things that we're trying to educate in our area. There's a lot of condos, houses, and people are using these rodenticide boxes that you see in the bottom all over. Uh, this is affecting a lot of different species. So in our area, we really are trying to promote it for the owls, but it's affecting all birds of prey. It's affecting mammals. I'm sure in some ways it probably is affecting reptiles, amphibians. But we are doing our part in trying to make sure that we can get this proof of testing. So any owls that we find that are completely lethargic or not able to move, sometimes we do find them already deceased, just laying face down with absolutely no sign of injuries or any kind of predation at all. We are taking them in, and this is the first year that we're able to work with Florida Fish and Wildlife to try to get them tested. I think if we're able to directly prove to the public that this rodenticide is killing the owls, uh, that would really enforce them to make some changes. So the bottom right you see is called a good nature trap. I have used these personally when I was working out on the beach and this is helping with controlling rats in different areas. But these good nature traps, they work because they have a CO2 cartridge. When the rat sticks its head up to smell the food that you put inside of there, it gets hit in the head right away, instantly dies, no poisons, no toxins, and anything that finds that rat then won't end up getting sick. Um, so it's really important to definitely educate this in all areas. We still see it at condos and hotels in our location as well. So we are working directly with the city um, to enforce that they can try to encourage people to make this transition as well. You can also use snap traps. Um, snap traps, just make sure you're tying them up, keeping them away from pets. Um, but equally to rodenticide, do not use glue traps. Glue traps can be very harmful to a lot of different organisms, especially if you're not keeping an eye on them. Okay, so I have some cool videos that I wanted to show you. Uh, we use game cameras, and these game cameras are helping us learn a lot more about the owl. So this is actually one of our starter burrows, and this was dug about two years ago, and the owls were very successful this season. So you'll see uh, the female is the one that's closer to down in the burrow. The male is the one staring dead straight into the camera. 
I just set out this camera. Uh, and so he was a bit angry that I put a camera there. They quickly adapted to it, uh, but it was great to be able to watch all their behaviors. So this is typical behavior of digging. This is what they're doing throughout the day, you know, nighttime as well, constantly maintaining that burrow, especially when their chicks are starting to come out. All that decoration that they have on that mound that you see, over time, they start picking it away. Um, so at that time, whether their chicks are able to start feeding on their own or they just wanna keep their nests clean, all the decoration disappears. This is a cool shot at night. <laughs> so you see that the owl came in with food, he tosses it off and goes right into the burrow to go feed the chicks. Um, so in this situation, we are watching a pair that the male would do most of the hunting, but I saw that every once in a while, the female would go off to hunt on her own. Um, and this male seemed to get upset about it because he would call her in and say, hey, I have food, come back. <laughs> and at sometimes he would go to try to feed the chicks and she wouldn't let him. She would push him out of the way and say, it's my job to feed the chicks. You go back out and hunt. <laughs> And this last one, you'll see in his feet, he has a Cuban tree frog. Uh, and you'll see that the female was out hunting and she comes in with some food and she's very excited with the food that she has and she runs back into the burrow to go feed her young. <laughs> so it's very cool to watch these behaviors. Uh, this specific site, I was tracking individually what they were bringing into the burrow. I found that cockroaches was one of their favorite foods that they were bringing during the time that their chicks were young. And then it slowly increased to larger items such as lizards and frogs. Um, one night they brought in 69 cockroaches, about four frogs, and then a quick mixture of like 10 to 12 lizards. Uh, so all night long, they're just constantly feeding and which is why during the daytime, they're doing a lot of their resting. So these were their chicks. <laughs> you can see how cute they are and you can see the trash can. This is right in someone's front yard. Uh, this family actually has two kids. They love the owls. They also have a huge pit bull dog. The owls weren't scared of that dog at all. You know, they kept it on a leash. They made sure it never went anywhere near that burrow, but it just shows how resilient these owls are to be willing to nest right in someone's front yard. So to talk about Hurricane E in a minute, um, the big first question that we had from so many people when I came in the island was, did the owls make it? Are they okay? Did they survive or did they get flooded? The burrows definitely flooded. Most of Marco Island was underwater for a period of time. Nothing compared to Fort Myers at all, but a lot of their burrows were flooded and it just took a while for the water to drain. Uh, their postings that were protecting the burrows were completely destroyed. So we spent the last two weeks going around to all 340 of our sites, fixing all these postings. These owls spent the whole time of the hurricane using structures such as houses, buildings, vegetation, anything they could find to protect themselves from the wind and the rain. They're incredibly smart. So far, we have not come across any injuries or mortality whatsoever. Um, so we know that they know how to survive hurricanes. They've been through them before. Uh, the only thing that we faced was just the, the differences of boats ending up too close to their postings, um, to cars that were everywhere that definitely were damaged that we had to make sure weren't parked too close to burrows. So it was hard for the owl staff to go back and redig their burrows, but nothing compared to what they would have been through if this was during their nesting season. So we were very thankful that it happened after nesting season. So all the chicks were fledged. And, and everything was good for them. Uh, the tropical storm that came through was nothing compared to this, obviously. So that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free. Uh, and if you wanna reach out to us at any time, if you know of anyone in our area that you know would be interested in volunteering, we're always looking for any help with any of our programs, but feel free to check out our website and our Facebook. The AWE biology blog is where I do most of my posts and cool videos from the field and uh, anything that may interest you volunteer-wise. So thank you so much for having me tonight and I'll answer any questions. Wonderful talk. You, you gave so much information that I didn't know about these burrowing <laughs> uh, uh, What Does more than one uh, 
pair are there in a nest or in a hole? Burrow? More than one pair. So we only have a couple sites that the owls have shared a location, but they still have separate burrows. They are territorial. So the pairs definitely don't want to have multiple owls nesting in the same direct area. We think at those sites, most likely it's their young that they're allowing to live right next door. Um, but most of these owls, they have at least pretty distinct territories. During the off season, which is right now, we see owls all over the place. I think they kind of put everything aside and you'll see mass numbers of owls together feeding. Sometimes the people at the golf course tell us that they see up to 20 owls feeding all together on the golf course. So it depends on the time of year, um, but not during nesting season, they're pretty territorial. You must have more owls than any other county, I think, in Florida. Cape Coral is the biggest population in the state and we are the second. So it's pretty incredible. Are there any locations on the East Coast? I know that there are some, but not as much as this coast. Um, so my FWC boss is out of Fort Lauderdale and they do have some burrowing owls in that area. They're just not as big as population. I think it's just lack of the habitat that they require. Um, so you may have great habitat for other organisms, but it's just not that suitable sandy soil that they need to be able to live on and open areas. So they're not gonna be in dense vegetation. Uh, so all of our postings on the island, we actually weed whack down. We have a great crew that helps us out as well. So to make sure that we can keep the grass low, otherwise they keep digging in other areas that are mowed because they need it to be open, free of vegetation. Are you familiar with the Miami, Miami Executive Airport? I, in um, January, 2021, I had a guide uh, take me there and I saw a burrowing owl. Yeah. Oh, awesome. No, I, I'm not familiar with that post. Um, my knowledge of burrowing owls of locations uh, extend from Collier County and then I, I helped out up in Wachula, Florida for banding. So I'm not familiar where they all are, but I can only imagine with all this development that we're going to start seeing burrowing owls in more locations. Uh, if they're losing it, they may leave Marco. They may start going inland. Uh, we know that we're probably going to see more owls even in just Naples itself. So really all depends. I'm looking at the chat. Uh, there's a question of, do we have these over here? Uh, there's definitely owls on your coast. And if you're talking about the other coast, just depends on the location. Definitely not in this big of numbers, um, but they may be dispersed. There's a lot of owls that quite honestly, I think we don't know where they are. So it really takes the public, you know, notifying us when they see them in areas. They do also live in grasslands and farm fields. So it's possible that in agriculture, you know, you know those areas, you may see that they have owls that they're used to. Uh, they can live amongst the cows and any of that habitat. So it's possible. And the next question is, how do we start a burrow? Uh, I would say the, the best thing to do with starter burrows is if you're seeing them in your area, it's worth a shot. If you wanna just try to see if you can attract any that may be flying around, go for it. Um, we use a shovel that is rounded on the end and we basically dig down just a little bit and then we turn it upside down and use it to curve out that tunnel. And then we just make a big fresh sand and add a tea perch. Um, so that's really all we have to do. And, and then ensure if, if they do dig that burrow um, and they excavate it, that burrow will become protected. So it's just important to know if you do attract an owl to your property, you wanna make sure that you protect the tunnel. You don't want anyone to run it over with a lawnmower or any vehicles at all. Um, and then if you do have to have it removed any time, you just gotta make sure that you apply for a permit. Um, with our program on Marco Island, it's actually one of the only safe harbor programs of its kind. Um, so we actually have an agreement that's made with Florida Fish and Wildlife, the city and us that if someone digs a starter burrow in their front yard and at any time they wanna remove it, instead of paying for a permit, we can remove it for free. Um, because they're doing the you know, incentive of, you're gonna dig a burrow in your front yard, we're gonna let you remove it for free because most of these people don't even want to remove it. They wanna keep those owls, but at any time the owner changes or anything like that, we wanna make sure that we keep these owls safe. Any other questions at all? Is there a way that we could get some more owls into our county here? I mean, we do have a few, but 
Yeah. <laughs> I would say where, where you do have them, look at the habitat around it um, and try to encourage people to do starter burrows because when they have their young, their young are going to be looking for a burrow of their own. So that's, you know, these owls will stay in their habitat for as long as they can. So we have pairs that have nested in the same exact spot for year, for years. But if they have six chicks, the chicks that survive are going to be looking for a burrow the next year. So anywhere nearby, feel free to try a starter burrow and you may be able to attract them to your area. Do you have instructions on how to do this, uh, written instructions? or? We can show you for sure. Um, there are videos online, but they actually use an, an artificial burrow. Um, so on your post, actually, there is a group that does artificial burrows. They use kind of sort of like a flexible PVC, and then they use a box underground. Um, we don't do that because we've never had the need to. Uh, the owls like our starter burrows. We don't really need to attract them to anything. It's more work to do it that way as well. So we're lucky that we don't have to. Um, but we can definitely help out anyone that you know needs help knowing how to dig it. Feel free to contact me. I saw another question was, how does the owl chase away the gopher tortoise? <laughs> Owls are pretty defensive uh, and tortoises are very timid. So during the nesting season, I have actually watched on that property I showed you with the 144 burrows. I came up to the property. I thought an owl was pinned underneath the tortoise because all I saw was the owl on its back and a tortoise standing there. Thought he got its foot stuck or something. Maybe he was fighting with them and then he got pinned inside the shell. I walked up and I didn't have my camera on me because I was panicking that one of them was injured. And the owl was actually actively kicking the tortoise in the face, laying on its back, kicking the tortoise in the face. <laughs> so behavior like that, I mean, that was a once in a lifetime. I'm never going to see that again or capture it on video. Uh, but behavior like that, the noises that they make, tortoises are just going to give up. Most tortoises, it, in general, they usually have two burrows. So I think what happens in our area is during the nesting season, those tortoises will leave that burrow and say, fine, you can have it. I'm going to go to my other one. <laughs> or they may dig another one of their own. Uh, and then we've noticed that sometimes when they're done nesting and the owls are kind of moving all around during the winter, the tortoises will come back. So they're, they're pretty territorial and the tortoises just don't want to deal with it. <laughs> no, very good. Do we have any more questions at all? Yeah, I see. Is the gopher or the owl more endangered? Um, it's a good question. So both these species are declining, uh, definitely declining in our area. At this point, at least on my coast, I would say the tortoises are more in threat than the owls because the owls, number one, don't have to be physically relocated. We could just let them fly and find a new home. Uh, tortoises have to relocate to recipient sites. And one of the biggest things that we're trying to find more research about is understanding that when these tortoises are moved, way far away from their habitat, away from where they have, you know, families that's all together, but the different in the climate, different habitat, the stress of the whole transfer different areas, reptiles don't do well like that. So we are trying to find ways where we can have gopher tortoises move to closer recipient sites where they're not going 100 miles from their home range. Um, but looking at these two species, I'd say that the owls are able to adapt and they have the ability to have more habitat in the sense that they don't need as much. They don't need the forage. They don't need as much habitat for all their burrows. The burrows aren't as long either. Um, so at this point, I'd say that the tortoises are in the biggest threat. And that's really what why we started our Go for Tortoise program. A lot of people think Audubon is birds, so why are we doing tortoises? But because these two species are so closely living together in this area, it just made sense. Um, and at this point, it was it was a drastic need uh, that these tortoises are suffering on Marco Island. They're leaving so much habitat. Uh, we also have big issues with car strikes as well. So it was really important to combine these two so we could help protect them all. Right, very good. Your oh, presentation. Oh, actually I have a question. Um, what do the owls do that live in a front yard when the grass is being cut? Uh, you must be frightened <laughs> by the lawnmower. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so when we weed back the burrows, sometimes the owls will stand off and we have to physically push them away from the burrows just so we can weed back their area. Um, they don't really know the difference of we're helping them. <laughs> um, so 
they do get defensive, especially during the nesting season, but a lot of times they'll just go into the house's shutters. They may go to a nearby house uh, and just wait it out and use that as protection during the meantime. But I am always surprised by the owls that stand their ground and I have to physically push them out because I don't want them to get hit by the grass as we're waiting back in there. Very good. Your presentation was excellent. And I was wondering Thank if you, you could uh, put it on YouTube and, and uh, show it to people that couldn't attend tonight. Is that of be course. Right? Of course. Very good. Well, and I don't see, is there anything more in chat? Uh, done. Not yes. seeing anything else, but if anyone else has any other questions, um, I will put my email in the chat. That way anyone can reach out to me at all. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I, I guess we'll uh, call it the end tonight uh, for this presentation, but appreciate you all coming and uh, hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you.